Welcome back to React Native Radio Podcast. Brought to you by Infinite Nannies. Having trouble debugging your kids? Try our dependency injection services. Episode 250, React Native Firebase TLDR. When I stumbled into the Zoom room this morning, did I hear you right, Mazen? Were you saying that you've been looking for a nanny and and, and some of them that they're prices are just outrageous did you say did you say forty dollars an hour yeah now that was for nanny share so it was two kids but yeah i mean you have even have some people charging up to like 25 dollars, maybe 30 an yeah. hour for one kid right should i should i change careers i know right like <laughs> this episode nannies. brought to you by infinite <laughs> nannies we have a big network right of developers that could be repurposed they could be repurposed, like especially, you know, if things kind of go south in the software industry, maybe GitHub Copilot eats the software world and there you go. we're all out of a job. Yeah. Kind of I mean, there are agencies here. in the area that will, you'll interview with them and they'll find you a nanny, mm -hmm. but then they charge. I haven't looked into this. So this is, you know, word of mouth. It's like five grand for them to place you with a nanny. So there we go. There's another income stream placing wow. you with one of our <laughs> nannies. I remember my, so I didn't really do much babysitting stuff for my siblings but my sisters used to make like like peanuts when they would babysit it was horrible how little they made uh, i guess that's different than a nanny but you know it uh babysitting was not a not a very profitable thing back in the day i wonder what the going rate is for neighborhood babysitters now yeah yeah i'm just out of the loop I inflation am, I, inflation applies inflation. across the board yeah right and i'm very close to several hospitals and you have a lot of universities here too at the same time so the demand is high because there's a lot of lots of doctors families where both spouses are doctors and right. doctors nurses whatever the combo is and they yeah. have crazy hours so yeah. they're definitely looking for full-time nannies so these kids i would say because some of them are still in college are taking advantage yeah. of the situation and just you know charging oh, everyone an move to move to durham north carolina <laughs> become a nanny <laughs> wow um, I looked up, I was, of course, the way my mind works, I was like, where does the word nanny come from anyway? Apparently <laughs> Greek nana means aunt. It means aunt. Okay. So means that makes like sense. Auntie. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's probably totally what it was. Sense. The aunties took care and yeah. nanny, nana nanny. And here we are right, today. Right. Right. Well, uh, luckily my kids are, are getting old enough. My youngest is nine now. Uh, she turned nine last last month so it's and not your it's not your kids keeping you up until 3 a.m it's no i did stay up till yourself. 3 a.m but it was not my kids <laughs> i don't want to talk about it i <laughs> get scarred by it yeah uh, i i don't know I, i'm gonna be running at about 40 percent, which i already know the coffee really the coffee to... bumped it up from 30 to 40 already mm -hmm. so. <laughs> it, it did yeah they can tell like i was so confused coming in to this conversation originally but I'm a professional and I will power through and everybody will be very impressed. I think maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm Javen Holmgren, your host, unprofessional host and friendly CTO of Infinite Red. I am located in the Pacific Northwest, the beautiful Pacific Northwest, the very dry Pacific Northwest right now, which is unusual. Hot We're either dry. bone dry or underwater mm -hmm. all the time, but that's where we are. Uh, I am joined today by my radiant co-hosts robin and mazen and i know we say this every time but like how did we not find radiant yet? i this swear is... we've used radiant i feel like someone tampered with the show notes because i swear we've used it before but i searched for it and it wasn't there so it's not there here we are is it because of my crazy backlight that you thought about it Holy oh yeah cow. yeah maybe mazen's we got an angelic quick. halo behind him mazen is about to be beamed up to heaven he is <laughs> there's a bright light behind him uh Speaking of Mazen, he lives in Durham, North Carolina with his wife and baby boy. He's a former pro soccer player and coach and is a senior React Native engineer, uh, soon to be nanny, also here at <laughs> Infinite Red. Robin Hines, co-host as well, senior software engineer at Infinite Red, located also near Portland, Oregon in the Pacific Northwest or with her husband and two kids, and has specialized in React Native for the past five years. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, nice to be back. We, we've been kind of, um, I don't know if the audience has noticed, but we haven't really been 
recording a lot of episodes. Um, we had a few in the can, so they were sort of... Been a slow summer. Yeah. Our editors actually caught up with us. That's how how little we've been recording. What, why do you sound so surprised? <laughs> <laughs> Usually there's quite quite a quite a backlog. Yeah. Because uh, it takes us, what, an hour to record them, and it takes them several days to edit because don't give them excuses <laughs> because we make it very difficult for them to edit episodes <laughs> oh, wow we give them a lot to do for sure and they they are excellent they do an awesome job they spend a lot of time making sure it sounds really awesome so okay they're definitely going to make robin sound really good in this episode <laughs> and they're going to they're going to edit me in very awkward places they do a really good job <clears throat> This episode is sponsored by Infinite Red. Infinite Red is a premier React Native design and development uh, <coughs> uh, development agency located fully remote, <coughs> um, <coughs> fully remote in the U.S. and Canada. If you're looking for React Native expertise, hit us up. You can learn more on our website, infinite.red/react-native, and don't forget to mention that you heard about us through the React Native Radio podcast. <coughs> um, yeah. All right, let's get into our topic for today. Our topic is React Native Firebase TLDR. Too long, didn't read. Maybe TLDL? Too long, didn't listen? Too, I don't know. Uh, I Specifically, the doc, I was referring to the documentation for Firebase, which is lengthy because it does a lot of stuff. It does a lot. If In case you haven't looked into everything, the long list of things that React Native Firebase can do, this is the episode for you. Yeah, and we're talking about the it's the one at rnfirebase.io it's the it's the um it's like a third party library it's not the, like an official sdk but it uses the official sdk so but a little caveat first so a lot of times we are we, we kind of try to vary it up and there's more advanced topics and there's more beginner fo- topics and there's a lot of like intermediate topics i think we tend to like sort of we lean more toward the advanced topics just because of where we are in our react native journey but um but this one's probably more of a beginner focused one. This is more of an intro. I think if we were to do a deep dive into React Native Firebase, we'd probably have someone from their team on to talk about that. So I just want to set expectations a little bit. This is going to be a little bit more review if you've used it before, but... I don't want to hear you complaining on Twitter. <laughs> yes, we told you. We warned you. We warned you. Robin told me she would kick you out of the React Native community yep. group. So. I have that power. <laughs> She is I admin. do have that power now. During uh, research, even we graybeards learned some things about That's true. React Native Firebase. Mm-hmm. That's true. I, I bet you, even if you've used React Native Firebase on your last four projects, you will learn about something today that it does that you didn't know about. Wow. Throwing down the gauntlet. I know. I like I'm this. Putting that out there. So what's Firebase first off? Someone give me a, a quick overview of what Firebase itself is. What is Firebase not? It's a real question. Uh, Firebase is probably most known for cloud computing services. Uh, It's one of the providers of quote unquote serverless Mm -hmm. uh, architecture. So it does a bunch of stuff as a service that you would in the past would have had to have an entire server team. Firebase does a lot of that for you. I think the whole excuse of it's going to take me forever to build an app because I still need to set up a backend server database, et cetera, that kind of goes out the window with Firebase because Firebase does it all for you. Mm -hmm. And as we're going to get into it, React Native Firebase covers a lot of the bases for you then. So all you're doing is you're calling their functions per the docs. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's uh, it's a service that I think originally was not at Google, but Google bought them or something or maybe... I don't know. I don't know if Google created it, but it's at Google now. If we ever have someone from Firebase on the show, we'll have to ask about the history, the history of how it came to be. Yeah, totally. Uh, I've used Firebase several times, and I really enjoy it. I was going to say there, there's a lot of there's a lot of alternatives out there for Firebase, yeah. but Firebase is the most mature when it comes to it. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. um, we're going to list out like over ten items now. There's other alternatives like Supa Base, I believe, is one of them. That's or not Supa as Base. Ma- Supa Base, yeah, it's not as mature yet. I think they only have like two or three items from this list that we're going to go over Mm -hmm. the rest are coming soon like they're trying to catch up but then again you know you have google backing firebase and you have the the maturity and age of this package that's really giving like the benefit for it fun fact i got into open source back in oh i don't remember exactly 
like my first real open source was releasing a, a, a mobile package for a service called parse parse parse.com at that time, uh, which was eventually bought by Facebook. Hmm. Parse was basically a Firebase competitor and it used like MongoDB in the background. I loved it. It was awesome. It was super, super cool. And their team was awesome too. Mm -hmm. I'm actually still connected with a lot of their team on, on uh, Twitter and then Facebook killed it (laughs) and I was super sad. Uh, So Firebase was sort of the alternative. They were kind of fighting at that time. And then Firebase one just sort of by default after that. It's funny you say that parse was my go-to forever until Facebook bought them. And then I tried to stand alone a parse server. Yeah. And that was the worst experience of my life. So I moved, I was like, okay, who's, who else is out here? Yeah. I didn't know you did parse. Yeah. Okay. That's a very small, like, like tight knit group of people that did that. Like my mentor in the area, he still does parse and his entire library, well, his entire app and company is running off of parse still, but we digress. So do you know what my, uh, my library was called? Parsistence. (laughs) I thought that was pretty good. They should have bought that from you and trademarked it. So, uh, obviously back to Firebase, um, we're, we will specifically be talking about React Native Firebase. Right. Like when you install it, it'd be React Native Firebase. There's also, you can also use the Firebase.js web SDK because it's React Native and it's just JavaScript. I've actually used this probably a little bit more than React Native Firebase myself, simply because it works with Expo. So, but it does have some limitations. We'll talk about those in a bit. Uh, but Firebase JS is relatively straightforward to get going. You just have to do everything with like, you're clicking on all the web stuff and, and you know copying all the web stuff in. But uh, if you are, if you did want to compare that to React Native Firebase, um, on their docs they have like an FAQ and tips section. The first one is why React Native Firebase over Firebase JS SDK, which is the web version. React Native Firebase actually wraps Firebase Android SDK and Firebase iOS SDK. So the native packages, you get native mm-hmm. code. And so the main mm-hmm. benefits are that access to the native code. So uh, native SDKs actually have, there's more modules and more features, um, things like dynamic links, app distribution, crash analytics. Um, so you can actually monitor like, like native crashes and things like that. There are also some modules that are in both web SDK and native SDK. Uh, but generally speaking, the native, the react native Firebase side of things is going to support more. So, uh, things like in the background, you can like do background downloads for, for Firebase storage, and uh, you can do more performance stuff. I, I feel like um, a lot of this stuff is probably a little more kind of advanced features, but you definitely would run into these eventually. And the API is also a, a bit different. We're not going to go into that too much, but it definitely, you, you kind of have your your choice of which API you like out of those two. Oh uh, yeah, obviously it's going to be a lot lighter weight to just use Firebase JS if the features that you're using are js only they're not native specific um you can you can go a lot more lightweight just installing the javascript only uh but react native firebase gives you all of that basic web functionality plus a lot of native features as well yeah exactly and then the other piece of this is if you are using expo go especially um you would need to use the the web version however you can use it with Expo if you use config plugins, which we haven't gone over Expo config plugins on the show yet. I actually don't know much about, I haven't, I don't know much about config plugins. Think of it basically as like in your app, Jason, you would describe, I think it's in your app, Jason. Actually, I actually haven't done this, so I need to, I need to do more research on it, but you would describe, you would basically say, Hey, I want to use this plugin. And then when it generates your iOS and Android folder, cause you can just regenerate your folders. You're not like in there editing code. Yeah. Anytime you generate it, it would then modify your iOS and Android folders to have, you the know, stuff whatever that you functionality told it you want. To, yeah. Yeah. It seems like it's kind of like patch package, but for your, it is, it totally yeah. is. And then, uh, the, re- the benefit of that is when you upload it to their like EAS system, they deterministically also generate the iOS and Android folders and can build your app from that. So it's a pretty cool system. Use with Expo is, has some caveats. A lot of what we're going to talk about today, if you're using a bare React Native project, you're good to go. If you're using Expo, it's it's probably still possible, but you may have to do a little bit of extra. Yep. But yeah, we've got, uh, we're going to cover everything that the SDK includes, all the features that it provides, but we're not going to go into super depth 
about any any single one. Uh, this is more of a hey, did you know that it does all these things? All right, Mazen, kick us off. What are we What are we doing first? We're starting with the base one. Um, this one is the the docs call this core slash app. This is pretty much the way you would manually start when you start up your app, initialize the app, essentially linking your native SDKs, iOS and Android SDKs, to the JavaScript and that linking the credentials you would get from Firebase. So you need this to run anything that we're going to talk about next. Initialize, you know, you're exposing the different um, utilities to your develop your development. And it also mentions create a secondary Firebase app instance. So I think that means you can spin up uh, secondary Firebase instances using the core module. Yeah. So you could have, you can connect to multiple Firebase accounts or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Oh yeah. That's the core. Then you can delete the instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's basically the core. Most of the time you'll uh, be installing core in addition to one or several of the the rest of the packages that we're going to talk about. Um, but okay. you will always need to install core. If you're looking like if you're looking at the docs for any of the next ones, so next one yeah. we're going to talk about is analytics. To install an analytics, it'll say, you know, install and set up app and then install mm -hmm. analytics and then do your pod install for analytics. So always have to do that at the end of the day. So they're, they're doing this kind of in a modular way so that they don't have to, you're not including a bunch of stuff that you, you're not using. Correct. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Let's talk analytics then what uh i can infer what that is but <laughs> give me a quick uh overview there pretty much the same you know you can log events you can track user behavior you can set up either predefined data so it'll you know i, I believe it comes with some specific data like a user id i believe is one of them that you can set up but then you can also expand it to do email and other stuff along that they they have some reserved events. I won't go through them, but there's, it's a long list. It's like user engagement, app update, first open, app in the background, app remove. So a lot of different events that you can use, or you can actually create your own events. Way I've used this in the past is for looking into whenever you ping an API, there's just a quick log, like, okay, this API was pinged for more mm -hmm. detection, like crash detection mainly, but then also user. So whenever a user was created, I would log that user details and then eventually be able to track them and then have other tracks based off of that user, whether it was clicks or not. Yeah. So you're basically tracking how your users are using your app, um, what they're doing in the app. And you can tie that to things like geographic location, language preference, all sorts Absolutely. of yeah. uh, demographic information. Um, all this so stuff that we're going to go over goes into one dashboard, which is mm -hmm. great. And the dashboard is pretty simple to use. It has graphs, it has tables mm -hmm. and all that. So it's nice to have it all in one spot and at the same time in a simple UI to look at. Right. Yeah. I remember we used to have to build all this stuff. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's nice to have, yeah. it's nice to have someone else doing this instead. Oh so, yeah. Analytics. Cool. What's next? There's a, a service called app check, okay. which I've never used. I didn't know it was a thing. Um, but apparently it's a service that, uh, basically authenticates that requests are coming from an authentic installation of your app mm, uh, kind of that hasn't it. right that hasn't been tampered with uh, right. to protect against things like phishing fraud uh, other sorts of things so if your app is in sort of sensitive industries like maybe financial care whatever then yeah this is a service that will help ensure that it isn't being misused i remember way back in the day when you would install games, they would have these services that would protect against like hackers. I remember Punkbuster <laughs> was a big one. Punk, Punk Buster. Buster. So this is basically Punkbuster for see for, Firebase Punkbuster for yeah. Firebase. <laughs> so yeah, the a, a theme that you'll probably pick up on throughout this episode is that Firebase provides it's like a one stop shop. It's like the, yeah the yeah the, except one the thing which i'm going to complain about at the end <laughs> oh. so if it's a service that you need for your app firebase probably does it with some exceptions yeah. with one very glaring exception which jamie anyway. will tell us all about oh event. yeah i will i will complain about it stick so around that was that. that was uh called app check uh another thing they do is called app distribution we actually use this uh on mercari uh it's used for uh beta builds test builds uh it's you can do automated test builds. So we, uh, they have it set up to trigger a Firebase 
distribution build every time you merge a pull request, for example. Mm. Uh, so it's really easy for your testers to download new test builds. Um, really easy. Nice. Yeah. I, when I was on the, on the Mercari project, I remember that being the nicest thing. One of the nicest things that was there because if I created a pull request, I would tag it. It would create the build. I get an email. The new build is ready. Download it. Test it. Manu- you know, Do the manual test before it went out to QA. And then I could just you know tell QA, hey, test build number XYZ is ready yeah. to be tested. So and obviously this simple. like goes, it, it it's outside of the App Store, Play Store channels. And so it's a single channel for your iOS and Android test builds. Uh uh, which can be really helpful. So like a lot of times when you, when you talk about like adding Firebase to your project, usually you're thinking like Firestore or which we will talk about shortly and the real time database, but you can actually just skip the database side of it, the API side or that, that side of it, and then just do a lot of this other stuff. Like there's yeah. a lot of other stuff that, yeah. mm-hmm. and exactly. it sounds like that's kind of what we did over there. Mm-hmm. That makes yeah. sense. Let's talk uh, authentication. Yeah. So usually one of the first things you want to do is set up, authentication for your app so users can log in and log out. Um, This is all set up again. They have, you can set up your own way of sign up with email and password. You could do anonymous sign-in, which I think is pretty cool. You can also do Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Google, phone number. Yep. And then that covers it. All those types of logins. So, and you can also set up two-factor authentication, I believe. I haven't tried that, but again, two-factor authentication is also available. So, all your login needs are set up for you there with just simple functions to call. And then they also have a subscriber that you always want to set up for on-off state change. So that's essentially is your user logged in or logged out. And uh, this is another, this is one of the services that's not specific to native, right? So this correct would be available with just Firebase JS as well. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've used that on, on Expo projects for sure. And the on-off on off change on off state change, sorry, pretty much, you know, if you update your profile, say new profile picture or update your name for whatever reason, it would automatically create a callback. So, you know, your, your app re-renders. So you have to just be careful on that, you know, your re-rendering state there, but it's just a subscriber event that you listen to. This is one of those classic serverless uh, yeah. features. Yeah, the classic serverless side of it is, uh, well, actually Firestore is kind of their newer version of it, but, but that's the one I've used the most and uh it's no sql database cloud database um you can the thing that i really like about it is like you can have listeners so you can set up a query uh sometimes fairly complex queries and then if the results would change it will actually send you a callback you know, it's like a snapshot basically is what they call it and then you can re-render you can update your database it works really well with mobx and mobx state tree so it's one of those things where the mm-hmm. the, the integration is super good so um the other piece of this is there's also offline support. So you can be creating things as you're offline and then it'll sync up afterward. This stuff's all kind of built in. Pretty cool system, really. I'm I'm a big fan of Firestore. I, I like it a lot. It's um, it's not like a full replacement for the real-time database, <laughs> which we will talk about, um, but it kind of is. Like there's there's a lot of a lot of things that Firestore can do that you may be used to. Uh, try to do with the real-time database the offline mode is a big one i think that's something that makes it takes it to another level in the past you just have to handle it some way this is just all handled for you now you don't have to worry about anything the next one i want to go into is cloud functions so Mm. i think we use this internally right jamin with we do yeah yeah we have uh on our clue app uh, our internal app we have uh we use cloud functions on this quite a bit serverless Essentially, cloud mm-hmm. functions. If you combine cloud functions, authentication, and Firestore, you pretty much have an entire backend. That is your server. That's your entire backend. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Your backend there for you. And nice thing about it is it's simple to create your functions and then deploy them. You just pretty much run a command from your terminal and you can deploy that entire folder there. Yeah. Um, you run the code. I mean, we could kind of keep going into this, but it gives you HTTPS requests for you to call back against also. So yeah. if you're creating a full web and mobile app, you also have the ability to you know to ping the same APIs or from the same library. Yeah, and for beginners, uh, to be clear, these are not running on your React Native apps. You know, mm-hmm. they they you can call them. You can like say, hey, run this function over there, but they're running in the server uh, in the in the cloud. So 
that's helpful for things like a lot of times like callbacks. An example of this is um, for my one of my little apps that I've built. Um, when you authenticate and are accepted into a uh, a group, it will like do some setup for you. So mm -hmm. it's like a it's like a setup you know function that happens there. You would just call them like a promise, you know, with your yeah. Yeah. then and then catch. Yep. Or async await. Logic that you would want to run on a server, you wouldn't want to run on a client and and clog up threads on your device. You right. want a server to run it, but you can trigger it from the client side and have it run in the cloud. Very cool. Uh, we're kind of speeding through these, but um, that's because I kind of want to. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> uh, the next one you'll probably be familiar with is cloud messaging. Uh, React Native Firebase implements uh, a native wrapper around FCM, which is Firebase Cloud Messaging, which is a server to device or device to device communication framework. Uh, it's really versatile. It's basically just like anything you could think of that needs a message to go from like server to device. Uh, if you need to ping a device to say, hey, we're like, there's updates for you to get, you should fetch updates. Instant messaging, push notifications are included in this um, specifically. Uh, that's a native, a, a specifically native feature. Um, but like background push notifications are included in this. A super powerful feature. You're probably familiar with it. It's one of the, I would say it's one of the most common push notification uh, providers that, yeah, rea that React yeah. Native apps are using these days. You'll see the FCM acronym mm -hmm. all the time. So yeah. Firebase cloud messaging it usually means push notifications, but yeah. it can be a lot, of, a lot more. In the that. React Native context, it's almost always push notifications, but it's at, at its core, it's server to device or device to device messages. Yeah. And another aspect of this is if you kick off a function that could take a while and you don't want the user to sit there spinning and waiting, you can, this is one of the apps, one of the things we did in one of the apps I was working on, we would trigger the function and just say, you know, come back and check in later. Mm -hmm. And then the user could continue using the app. And if it was done in time, we sent a push notification like, hey, you know, this is done, check it. So then it'd pop up and say, hey, you know, your processing's done, do you want to view the data? Mm. You'd click yes, cool. it would then ping, it would then it's a nice receive user the data and then take yeah. you to that page. So is this the kind of thing that's happening in the background when like you're on a web page and it tells you to like go and do something in your app and you finish that and you like go back to the website and it like magically somehow knows that you did it and like knows. To <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of, I mean, if we were to, Be it's kind of that. like a web socket ish. Yeah. Kind of it's thing, true. But it's, it's a push notification telling you need, you need the logic in place, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's a web socket that needs additional logic to then do the fetch web socket. will just give you the data. Yeah. This you could, if it's not a lot of data, right? Unless, you know, if it's just like, hey, here's a string that you get back from this big processing thing, it could be returned in a in like an object. But other than that, it's just, hey, you know, this processing is done or this is done. Open the app to see the data. Mm -hmm. So yeah, re really, really powerful service. If you're thinking of implementing push notifications, you should be considering thinking of that. Yeah, yeah, this should be one of your contenders. Obviously, like Firestore and whatnot, they don't, you, you're not supposed to dump images and larger files and stuff into there. That's really just for like smaller bits of text. Data. So uh, they also have cloud storage. So that's probably what, similar to S3 or something, Mazen? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same S3 bucket storage type of, type of deal. Yeah. Drop in your images. That's like I said, <laughs> this whole list is going to be like, if you can think of a service that you might need. Right. Firebase probably does it. <laughs> S3 is probably the most well-known provider of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But if you but know what S3 does, way. this is... Speaking of bad. S3, do they have something comparable? They, they have all these services. I know that. They do. But do they have a simple package like what we're talking about right now? You know, React Native, AWS. I don't think they do. Yeah. Well, well there's well, Amplify, right? Amplify, I think, is probably the closest where you uh, it kind of glues these services together in a way that's a have we, more have we done an episode we haven't done an episode about employee have we no we haven't yeah i know that um i think there have been pre-infinite red episodes about amplify but uh we yeah. should definitely do it yeah i would say amplify is the what's the word yeah i can't think of the word comparable um <laughs> alternative <There's a> word <laughs> <laughs> uh well if you think of it just blurt it out uh, out of context in the middle of something else um one service that a lot of people use is uh, 
Crashlytics, which is also part of this. It used to be its own thing, and it was I think so. purchased yeah. by Google. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Again, real simple here where it gives you two things out of the box. One, whenever you have like a, let's say a native crash for memory heap or whatever that is, the app usually crashes. And then on reload, the data, the report is then sent to the dashboard. So then you can then Mm. view that. Um, Similarly, you also have whenever there's like a JavaScript error that Mm -hmm. also gets to come up and get uploaded for you. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty robust in that one, you know, the one caveat here is you have to upload your DSIMs, uh, your, your symbols just to make sure that it can read and you're not seeing this like crazy, you know, yeah. crazy crash report. It that... makes sense if you're stack trace, basically. Exactly. And it's like almost impossible to read. It'll give you the exact lines and say, you know, on this line, you're trying to undefined or whatever. This variable yeah. is undefined. Where do you find the DSIM for the people that are kind of new to mobile development, generally um, speaking? It's like, where usually does that spit come out from? in your build folder mm-hmm. somewhere close to where you're. And that's an iOS thing, right? Yes. Yes. If you like right click your app the build sorry there's like a show package i believe and then you can kind of dig into there and pull that file from there pull the decent yeah fastlane will also like it's possible uh in your fastlane scripts to extract that and then save it out like just as a file next to your yeah uh your ipk so it's easy to access I'm not yeah. ipk ipa file <laughs> ipa yeah <laughs> just, just recently actually apk uh, ipa yeah just recently one of the clients i'm working on came to me and said we're getting a lot of crashes we don't know why i was like okay Let's hook up Crashlytics as quick. It'll take yeah. a couple hours. We'll be done. Set up. Since you're already using Firebase, it's it's already set up. Why didn't they have it set up already? I know, right? Yeah. So we, we pushed it up and then they use, if I'm not mistaken, is it Bitrise for their their whole pipeline? And then we just linked to extract yeah. the, the DSIM and actually upload it. So that was all done in the pipeline. And one week later, we had 35 crashes. So it was <laughs> perfect to then figure it all out yeah you you have to have that kind of insight um if if you have a production app and you don't have something installed you need to get that in there but uh by the way real quick frank uh who is working with uh he's one of the infinite red so- software engineers he is uh working on and it should be out we are working on uh for ignite having kind of a built-in place to put crashlytics and if you would prefer sentry or or bugsnag or something Um, we're going to actually have a place in ignite where this is where you put all of your crash reports. And then we have a common API for reporting a bug, reporting a crash. So, um, it's going to really kind of like clean up, like just have a a dedicated place for it. Really straightforward. This is how you do it. Links to all the docs. You really don't have any excuses to not have crash (laughs) reporting if you're using ignite. Exactly. Uh, we also, uh, we, we referred to real time database as well. That was the kind of the original Firebase. Like that was original mm-hmm. what you thought of when you thought of Firebase originally. Predecessor to Firestore, um, it is kind of a giant object, really, is how they kind of store it. Just a giant JSON object. And then uh, you can, on top of that, you can do querying, sorting, filtering, things like that. So it's not a document store so much as it's a giant JSON object that you can put in the the cloud it's mm-hmm. kind of a cool idea uh but obviously there are limitations to that that they ran into so that's why firestore exists but mm-hmm. um but yeah uh that's that's essentially what i would say real time still has its place um i'm not going to go into all the differences right now between firestore and, and yeah. real time but uh, i tend to reach for firestore first but it's more there are some situations where yeah, yeah where real time actually does make more sense and it has some features that firestore doesn't so the next one is dynamic links uh, I think it's also ref- sometimes referred to as universal links. Mm-hmm. That's normally what what I have called it. But or deep linking. Yeah, deep links, yeah. universal links. There's some nuance to deep links versus universal links. Mm-hmm. Deep links specifically are just links that go deep into your app, so you can go several screens deep to a specific place with a single link. But universal links specifically work on it's like a a single link that will dynamically determine where to go either your native app either your native app or your website yeah yeah okay and in this case it'll determine which platform ios Mm -hmm. versus android um versus web so it is truly universal (laughs) 
or dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other adjectives you can I use don't. for them? <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> Basically, uh, so yeah, so that could be super helpful, especially for things like marketing emails or like um, user emails, because you can include a single link and it'll figure out where to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that is layered on top of deep links to put them directly into the app with in the in exactly the place they need to go with data, um, like any kind of parameters that you need to pass through as well. Mm. So that's a super useful feature. Uh, and then there's in-app messaging, which it took me a, a little bit to try and figure out what the difference was between in-app messaging and cloud messaging. I don't really like the word messaging here because I always think of it as being like chat. But yeah, this if you were yeah. to read the title, you would think like this is an easy way to chat with other users. On your yeah, own. right. No, yeah, which it's that's not what this is at all. It's it's similar to push notifications, but it's not push. It's not when the app is backgrounded. It's when you're you're in the app, like clicking around, uh, and you can get dynamic content presented to the user based on what they're doing hmm. to increase engagement. Or like if they're clicking around on a certain page and you have a promotion for that that item, you can show them. A message about that and you can control the content on the server mm -hmm. uh, so you can change you can iterate really quickly or like change copy really quickly yeah uh so it's yeah definitely for user engagement uh marketing that mm. kind of thing i don't yeah i don't know a ton about it more than that but yeah we're getting to the end of our list uh actually we just have a couple more remote config yeah it is what it sounds like it is yeah it i mean it's literally just a key value Okay. storage mm -hmm. pair on the server but it can basically be like your your env file mm -hmm. but like remote which i had no idea this existed and it makes so much sense yeah especially when you consider like the security implications of putting your keys in your bundle right like why have we not been doing this or like what what's the downside here what am i missing although i don't like the dot env comparison because if your if your React Native app can read it, then so can the user. The reason being yeah. that they can hack your bundle and say, "Hey, yeah. show an alert with this thing." So mm -hmm. even this wouldn't be secure. Yeah. This would be more. This would be more like the parts of the .env that are just more around, like yeah, just not secure stuff. Um, we should actually have a whole episode. Let's put a note. Let's have a whole episode about that other piece because I've got yeah. some stories that we can tell about <laughs> it and there's some things that we can do. Config. I'm, uh, yes. I'm with Con you though, Robin. It's Config like, is a complex problem. It's, it mm -hmm. can be tough. It's, it's other, other types of use cases, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just a key value pair. So there's a lot of things you can do with it. It's pretty versatile. Yeah. Um, one example they gave in the documentation, which I had never thought about was translation files oh. so if you're using if you're mm -hmm. doing i18n you can store your translations so that if there's typos or changes you can update them right away um you can mm -hmm. add them remotely you don't yeah. have to do a new build just to add a new language right i wonder how often this is fetched or is it on i guess quote unquote document change mm -hmm. i'm not sure um, so you know like you mentioned translation typos i feel like that you don't want to rebuild your entire app because you misspelled a word. Yeah. Right. So I wonder how quick it would take for the user, how long would it take for the user to get it? Uh, there yeah. might be a listener. Activate. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but definitely useful. And that's something I'll be mm -hmm. paying attention to. Um, and the last thing we have on our list is performance monitoring. So uh, Mazen. Yeah, it's exactly what, what it sounds like. <laughs> you yeah. get to like monitor the performance of startup and it'll automatically trace events in your code. And mm -hmm. as with all of these so far, you can set up custom tracing if you want to see how long a specific function took, for example. Mm -hmm. If you think that's what's bottling neck, like your bottleneck, um, some parts of your UI. And you can also put attributes or, you know, whatever data you want. There's like put attribute and put metric. So you can attach user ID. So you know what user mm. is slowing down, you know, maybe because they have a lot of data mm -hmm. associated with their account. Um, which is why it's slowing down. So yeah, easy way to to have metrics around your entire app. Yeah, I think this one's probably underutilized, especially at first uh, on apps. And that's something that mm -hmm. I think would be very, very helpful. Nice. So there's one thing missing, which just blows my mind a little bit. Jamin was very outraged <laughs> about this. Yeah. 
Rightfully so. So who owns Firebase? Remind me. Google. Google. Okay. What what's Google known for? <laughs> Search. Maps. <laughs> Maps. <laughs> Maps. <laughs> okay, that's also missing. But, uh, uh, search, primarily. Search. Yeah. There's no search. No. There is no search. There's no, nope. there's no way to search. I mean, you can do queries, but that's not the same as search. Queries and search are, are kind of two different things. And literally, they're like, yeah, you can like download all the data and then search it locally. <laughs> 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 or you can tie into these three non-Google search providers uh, that they lay over the top of your Firestore and um, and Google. Real-time. What are you doing? What are you doing? I don't get it. Why wouldn't there be Firebase Search? Like just Seems make like it. Of all the serverless providers, Firebase owned by Google should be the one that has just like a slam dunk, an amazing search. search. Like wouldn't that yeah. be a like full text search uh, yeah. with with all of the features of Google where you can just be like, I mean, just like is like the amazingness that is that is Google search. I don't know. It would be hilarious if Amplify had that. It would. I know, right? It would. I suspect it does because the they irony. have like Elastic Search. So, so I, I don't know. Like I am, I, I guess I'm um, disappointed. Yeah, I guess I'm disappointed. I'm just disappointed. And I, I actually needed this for a project um, more recently and. Uh, I ended up finding a different solution, but it was uh, like I was I was just kind of blown away that there wasn't just a feature to enable and then query it. Like, so, hey, here's my text. Now give me the all the documents that, that that match this. So Firebase team, if you're listening to this, come on our show and explain what gives. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you just hate Google the overlords, <laughs> you know, or what's going on here? Yeah, we want to know. Inquiring minds. So if you want to learn more about uh, React Native Firebase, go to rnfirebase.io. Um, shout out to, how do you say the, the company name? Invertase? In, Invertase? In- Invertase. Invertase. I-N-V-E-R-T-A-S-E limited. Um, they are kind of like open source, awesome people. They're really like into, they do React Native, but they also do Flutter, which is kind of interesting. But they... Mm. They maintain uh, React Native Firebase and a few other services like Notify, which is um, kind of an enhanced uh, notification service for React Native that uses uh, Firebase, that uses FCM um, to, to, to do the thing. Flutter so I did want to give them a shout out for sure. And we'll probably have some people from from their team on later at some point. If you'd like to learn nerd out more about React Native, check out my Twitch stream at rn.live i have not been streaming as much this summer but it's going to resume don't worry uh winter's coming i'm going to be doing some hacking some cool stuff i was actually doing some really fun stuff last night which is why i'm so tired (laughs) uh and i was not streaming it but it was like kind of a fun exercise so uh you can also join our slack community community community.infinite.red over 2,000 react native developers in there the new twitter community Keep your head down. Be nice. Otherwise, Robin <laughs> will find you. Rntwitter.infinite.red. Uh, where can people find you on Twitter, Robin? I'm at Robin underscore Heinz. Mazin? At Mazin Chami. I'm at Jamin Holmgren. And you can find at Re- React Native RDIO for our show Twitter, which honestly, I, last I checked, we had an impressive number of followers. We have 8,500 what? followers. Wow. Okay, who's following React Native Radio but not following me? <laughs> I don't even think I've cracked 500 followers, guys. What's... It's a little bit like Robin's getting close to 1,500. Yes. Um, you should go follow her. <laughs> but how many times do we say this? Mazin, of course, you do need to tweet sometimes, Mazin. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mazin doesn't tweet <laughs> enough. He retweets all the Infinite Red stuff. <laughs> Which I appreciate. I mean, I that's... try. I try to tweet when I think of stuff to tweet, but you you've been doing better lately, Robin. I, <laughs> I I'm very impressed. You had a you had a pretty good tweet that kind of went pretty good. Yeah, recently. I I got into the 300. I need to read it. Mapping before filtering. This is in regards to JavaScript arrays. Uh, mapping before filtering is like taking all the food out of your fridge and heating everything up and then putting everything back except the thing you're going to eat. <laughs> that's a good tweet. That is that's a good, a good tweet. tweet. Yeah, so Robin tweets good stuff. I tweet a bunch of random stuff. I had a good one the other day that kind of went. It does not matter. I don't know why I'm talking about this. Um, <laughs> We're <laughs> thanks just to our like producer dragging people out. I know. We know they're waiting. 
uh probably someone who can't reach their phone to like skip that's probably who who's still listening right now uh thanks to our producer and editor todd worth our assistant ed- editor and episode release coordinator jed bartoski our designer justin husky and our guest coordinator Derek greenberg thanks to our sponsor infinite red slash infinite nannies check us out at infinite.red slash react native special thanks to all of you listening and of course robin we have our new segment this is segment called? is called robin's mom joke robin's uh, mom joke i love it we need like a song intro we do okay we do. we're gonna come in- up with a sting yeah we are okay okay in the future yeah so at our retreat a couple weeks ago uh one of the prizes that i won because we all there was a ton of prizes gant did a great job with prizes but one of the prizes that i won was a giant book of dad jokes but i'm not a dad <laughs> so this is going to be every episode we'll do robin's mom joke and i'll try and get through the whole book uh I'm going to skip the lame ones, but <laughs> okay, here, here's well, the, there here's are no the lame dad jokes. <laughs> no, that's the, okay. Maz and I went different directions. Uh, okay. The first, the first Robin's mom joke. Did you hear about the cow who jumped over the barbed wire fence? No, it was mm-hmm. utter destruction. <laughs> uh, they're all going to be like that. Uh, they're all going to be grown worthy. Uh, you said you were going to skip the bad ones. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Robin, for that. We'll leave you all with that. Um, all right. See you all next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.